Hi, Patrick. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak to me. Really appreciate it. Um, if I tell you a little bit about, about who I am uh, and what I do here at Trident Search. So my name is James Chichester. I am the uh, only pre-sales recruitment consultant for Trident Search, and we're a specialist cybersecurity recruitment company. Um, I own the pre-sales market, so all everything wonderful to do with sales engineers, that's my responsibility. Um, I tend to work with uh, startups or enterprise organizations, so looking to place experienced sales engineers there. Um, but I get a lot of information, a lot of feedback, a lot of interest in what is sales engineering as well, um, which is why I really wanted to start this these series of, of videos to explore sales engineering, because obviously coming from um, a background that wasn't in the industry, I'm an ex-police officer. I spent about mm -hmm. 15 years cool. in policing joined Trident in uh, January of this year, um, was given the pre-sales market to own and really build out um, in February. Um, and I had no idea about what pre-sales engineers are. And really in that time, it's just illustrated to me what an important function of that is um, in the cybersecurity industry. And anyone who's in the know, anyone who knows pre-sales engineers knows what a massive figure you are in that market and how important the work is that you're doing. So I was really happy um, that we were able to reach out and that you were kind enough to, to give me a time and, and to appear to be the first on, on this, this video series. So I think turn it over to you and just, I'd love to know a little bit more about who you are, what you do, and, and then we can go on from there. Yeah. Anytime, James, thank you very much. And, uh, I love your story about being the police officer and going to pre-sales. Oh, thank you. I think that's, that's amazing. And yeah, who am I? So I, today. I'm a pre-sales trainer um, and coach, right? So what my company Sales Hero does is I train sales engineering teams um, on, let's say, innovative uh, ways to think about their role and to yeah, to shape, sharpen their skills, right? And maybe some of the topics we can talk about today, like, yeah, how do I take control of a deal cycle, right? Mm -hmm. And why this is important, yeah? Mm -hmm. I worked as sales engineer with MuleSoft and... This was already like eight years ago. Yeah. Uh, Microsoft went IPO. We got acquired by Salesforce. So we, we were quite successful. And I was the first sales engineer in DACH. So in the, uh, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, right? Appropriation is DACH. And there I did everything that you can potentially do. So I did the road shows with AEs, right? So we traveled. Um, through a whole Germany. <laughs> um, I tried to support as many as e AEs as I could on potential opportunities. I showed our software. This was an enterprise service bus, bus solution. And later on, and this gets then more interesting, the role changed because our vision changed. We were going away from a product-centric view, which was still important. The product is still important. But what we actually sold also as sales engineers is, was a vision, right? A methodology, something compelling, something new. Yeah. And that's what I tried to take into um, the modern role of the sales engineer today. Right. And this is what I train people. In. And that's also where I want to go, like build up a new um, or fresh view on the role yeah. um, with really the a principle based role so that I know every day, okay, this, those are things I should, could hold on to whenever the going is tough and the going is tough a lot of times because yeah, the sales engineers are sales people, right? At yeah. the end. Yeah. Um, so, but, but I know there is some, there, there are some people who say, no, I don't want to be in sales. Right. Um, I just say, yeah, that's needed. So, but at the end we are, we are selling software and you need, certain skills for that. And the more you can be remembered by clients, the more you can bring some unexpected creative tools into your meetings. Yeah. The more successful you will be. Right. Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. And you bring up some really interesting points there as well about um, principles and almost the ethics of being a sales engineer as well. Um, mm -hmm. What about yourself? You know, if for someone looking in into this wonderful, wonderful world of sales engineering, who hasn't got that experience and people speak to me all the time and say they might come from a purely technical background or from a sales background. Uh, what is a sales engineer? How do I become a sales engineer? How do I get into it? If you were to um, put your cards on the table and someone was to ask you, 
Patrick, what is a sales engineer? What what answer could you give a typical answer to that? A generic answer? What you know, you could go around the houses for you. What what does that encapsulate when people say what is a sales engineer? It it's it's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> um because I have a very con concrete view on what a sales engineer needs. So for me, it's it's the person who knows everything from product to the market uh, <clears throat> where your prospects live in, right? And they are storytellers. They can speak from experience what they actually maybe um, yeah saw in the former jobs, right? Because if they're new in sales engineering, they might have experienced some other domains, which is great, right? Development, product management, uh, some accountant, p police officer, right? Pilot, I don't know. Um, you will have anecdotes you can say, you can tell and explain. And this is needed because um, I think sales engineers are credible people, right? So you want to trust them. Your client wants to trust them. Um, you want to be trustworthy, the trusted advisor, right? This is a term often used. And for this, you need a lot of skills, right? So you're, some people say you're this Swiss army knife, right? Um, yeah, yeah. It, it's tough to say, but you, at the end, you need to explain something complex to a buyer and you need to build up a relationship with, with those people so they trust you and want to buy from you. I mean, and you bring business value in some sense, yeah. right? So that that's what you bring out of the product. And it's sometimes tough. Mm -hmm. People cling to the product, say, ah, this is my, my worth and value is the knowledge about the product, yeah. which I think isn't true, right? So be careful with this kind of thinking. If you think this, you need different principles, please, yeah. because you won't be happy with this. Software changes. It's not timeless, right? It's only timeless um, what you base your decisions on, right? I mean, that's I why it's complex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as I understand it, in, you know, coming from a completely different environment coming in, a sales engineer, to me, you have to be that technical evangelist that you've mm -hmm. got to walk the path in in two streams almost that you have to be technically adept but you have to be a great people person yeah. you so as, as i understand it you know, sales people they're going out there and you know not they're knocking on doors they're creating these opportunities they're meeting clients they're meeting customers they're they're booking those meetings they're understanding the client's needs or the customer's needs they're really the sales engineer they go in there they meet the customer or client they manage their expectations. They understand the pain points of the technology, how best they can serve that, what kind of product that they want. And then they build on that. They, they develop that concept. Um, and through that, it's a really interesting dynamic, the relationship and the skills and qualities that you need as a sales engineer. Um, a question that I'm asked quite often is, do you have to have do you have to come from a sales background to, to become a sales engineer? What are your thoughts on that? Or do you need, do you need that technical background to, to transition into that role? Um, no, no. I think it pays off if you have industry experience mm. in a certain area. And, and it pays off if you can transfer this, if you move into a sales engineering role and you take this knowledge with you. Yeah. And all those stories, all those experiences, right? Mm. Um, yeah, what, what would be example um, if you worked, like in my case, if you worked as an, a middleware architect at IBM, mm. right? And you saw a lot of middleware implementations and then you moved to MuleSoft, which is a you know, hip new enterprise service bus company in 2014, you can bring a lot of stories, right? And therefore credibility. Yeah? You don't need to know the sales part. You you have to be trained in that and you have to train it and you have to act actively acquire knowledge about this. There's no way around, I think, if you want to become really successful or even build in a startup towards IPO, you are expected to, to become more salesy, but mm. still keeping your technical part up. So as you said, I love the evangelist's point of view. You're an evangelist of your product. You have to know it inside out. But this is what you often get trained by your organization, right? So there is also, you will get pushed to learn all this um, tech stuff from product management, from um, developers, right? So you will get this information. You will be trained and certified. The push is not so hard on the sales side, but you should learn 
what is business about? What what are your customers doing? Mm-hmm. What about your customers' customers? Right? How do they think? How do I do desk research? Right? How am I persuasive? 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 I I don't get the word right. Persuasive. Uh, yeah, you know what, what I mean, right? How am I perceived? I I'm a perceived, and how can I persuade pe- pe- people? Is there an adjective? Uh, doesn't matter. <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, how, how can I get people to like me, right? Without being pushy and with, without feeling or saying this with a weird connotation, mm. right? It's something natural you need to accomplish. You want people to trust you immediately. And there are different ways to also do this. So, and today, especially if you're an introvert, uh, social media is a big thing, right? Mm. It might sound like a conflict, but I believe that social media is made for introverts. Look at Bill Gates or Craigslist, right? So those inventors were all introverts and they used the platform to get an indirect access to people, right? And the same is true for sales engineers. So put yourself out there, be visible, build your brand with content that relates to your industry, maybe to your product, right? To your strengths. Who are you as a person? Mm. That makes sense because prospects will, will hopefully see that, mm. or you could push them to see it. And then you, um, when you meet them the first time, for me this was always tough. I was nervous. Uh, whom will I meet? Right. Um, once you have the social in between, and they know you, the call is warmer. Right. So there is an easier entry into a conversation. Right. So th- those are things that. That changed over the years, and I think is transforming the role now. You know? mm. I mean, you raised a really interesting. I mean, you've raised a lot of interesting points. So, just touching on that, is you mentioned that that you would have been nervous as a sales engineer. You've been nervous. Yeah. What tools did you use, and what tools did you put in place to manage that energy, um, and to transfer it, and perhaps managing the deal or managing the expectations of a client and essentially taking control of that interaction. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's something I try to train today. So taking control of the deal cycle. So because um, sales engineers need to have the feeling of control Um, and then that's very natural, right? If, if you don't have, you will find yourself in a role where you get pushed around. Do this demo, fill out the RFP, right? Do that, join this meeting. Even if you just sit there as a technical, like in case there are technical questions, right? Um, you you sit there and waste time. You don't want this. You want to control. And um, there's a story about Nelson Mandela, right? He was, I don't know, two decades or longer in, in prison, right? And as far as I know, he told other prisoners to not be angry on somebody, but to to take control. So if people told them, uh, walk faster, right? Then he's told them, hey, take a bit of control, walk slower first, right? No no matter what it is, make it your own decision first before you actually listen to the other person. And that kept them happier. And, And it's the same in the deal cycle. You can't control everything. But if you look at steps like what do we have? We have a qualification at the beginning. I have, I have a diagram here. So we have qualification at the beginning, for example. Um, then we can control by asking the account executive already, hey, why will we win? What do you think? What's going on here, right? Why does the customer need, need to change? Why is it urgent to them? And why do they want us? By just asking this, you completely understand if the account executive did their job, mm. right? Pre-qualifying, looking at the account, maybe having a vision already, up, maybe maybe even up to the close. And this was a pretty big <laughs> for us at Muso, um, because um, there was this yeah, questioning technique called sequence of events, right? So we were always asked, what's the next step after next step after ne- the next step until the close? And we said, well, we don't know. We just started, right? But that's not the point. And that's what I learned later. It's really planning this through. So what do you intend to do? And what are your next steps, right? So, and also tell your customer. And this is how you take control, right? And this alone gives you more confidence. 
And then before you join as a sales engineer, before you join, for example, a discovery call, you do do desk research, right? Good pre-sales people do desk research. Mm. Um, and there are simple techniques. Um, one is called the big three. I, I like this. That's pretty straightforward. You take just 10 minutes and you look for three industry trends of your customer. Three initiatives, how, how they want to leverage or uh, yeah, mitigate this trend, right? And then you can use three of your solutions to solve or to help with these initiatives. This takes you 10 minutes. If you do this for every account, you have a perfect arsenal, right? So if you go into an internal account strategy meeting, you can just tell, okay, I want to do this opportunity because those three trends, those three initiatives, and this is the three ways we help. For the client in the discovery call, you can simply ask those questions. Hey, what about the trend there? I haven't seen a, an initiative on your website. Well, I found this initiative. Can't be helped there. Oh, you can't speak about this? Who can, right? Can we have access to this other person? Yeah. So um, this is how you start taking control even very early. Yeah. That's such an interesting point. It's just about, it's getting that confidence, isn't it? And there's something really interesting that just to pick up on about, you talked about the dynamics between the SE and the account exec. Mm -hmm. In your experience, and is this something that people have spoken to you about the relationship between the sales engineer, the salesperson, the account executive, or <laughs> others in the sales life cycle? How have you found that in your experience? Yeah, it's important. Yeah. Um, Can that be quite fractious at time? Maybe unrealistic expectations set out and we'll, we'll move on to that. And so, I mean, certainly I've, I, again, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I had no appreciation for what a wonderful job and how important sales engineers are in the sales life cycle, especially now that we see and we work with so many companies that are growing and are now appreciating the importance of the SE because what we have and what we found is companies scale up, great deal of investment goes into their sales team. Um, they hire salespeople, new business, account execs in. They go out, they get this business, they bring it in, but they don't invest in SEs. They don't invest in sales engineers. And what you have is you have an organic bottleneck almost where we have business mm -hmm. coming in and it floods the SE, they get overwhelmed. And they, they, they can't manage that work simply because they, those systems aren't in place. And that can damage the relationship between the SE, the can exec, SDR, um, new business, whatever you want to call it within the company, become quite fractious, quite antagonistic. Ultimately, the relationship, those relationships suffer. Um, the service to the client suffers as well. And that's a big thing for SEs that I've spoken to about, you know, they want to do a great job. They want to provide a great level of service to a customer. And at times they, they can't do that. So that's, for me, that's why it's important that we appreciate the, the relationship and how we manage those relationships as an SE. Yeah, absolutely. There are different types of account executives. Mm. The, the earlier you're on a startup journey, you will have sales engineer um, account executives that, 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 that they will lead. They're the wolves, right? So they go out there and they will hunt uh, for new business. And that means they will use sales engineers. Use in contrast to partner with. Mm. But if the business grows and, and the sales engineering team puts processes in place, they will struggle because then they will say like, oh, um, dear manager, right? So DAE, they, they, they don't do account strategy meetings with me. They don't appreciate that I need a discovery session. They just want me to demo. And this, this is really interesting um, situation in a startup. And I believe it can't be solved by the VP sales yelling down at the AEs yeah. and telling them, look, there are sales engineers, um, partner with them. Instead, it must be the sales engineering team setting up you know, the guidelines on showing their value by understanding sales better. So mm. by saying, hey, why will we win? Why don't you know this right now? We are a team. Yeah? Um, let's work together there. Please, let's have an account strategy meeting. Yes, I filled this RFP for you, right? But you give me something in return, and this might be the account strategy meeting. Let's plan our steps ahead. And by the way, I have my steps here, right? Because I want to do scoping before I do a POC, right? So I want the commitment of the economic buyer 
before I implement something, yeah. before I waste my time. Yeah. And and this is how you build this up later on, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. I remember I, I had about 13 AEs in 2015 that, that I worked for. It was a mess. Yeah. Um, w one really was not not nice, right? I flew out to, I think it was Sweden, somewhere in Sweden. And the, the morning in the hotel, he told me, yeah, I canceled just the meeting. And I told them, your plane was late. Oh, what? What did you do? Why you lied on my behalf, right? It was ridiculous, right? And then I spent there. I had a small daughter at home, right? And then then I spent a day in in Stockholm for nothing, right? It, like, but what what it led me to was I started. I remember I started meditating just to get um, in a healthier mood, right? To get more resilience because this happens so often, yeah. and this is just sales, right? And, and it's up to you to change the culture. And this is this was the moment when I changed how I worked. Here, here are the boundaries, right? That's what I do. So far, that's that's how far I go. And most sales engineering leaders will protect you. They will protect their ICs, so individual contributors, to um, set up boundaries to build a healthy culture, right? And and I think that's also a responsibility of sales engineers. And I'm speaking mostly startup. Yeah. yeah or yeah series a b c d funding um uh, rounds right so th this is where this is most critical i think later on or if you get acquired you work in big organizations that's a bit different mm. i think you it's tough to radically change culture you have to live some way so you have to find a way um and maybe an intuitive way to work with the processes right but but yeah that, that's so I see it. Uh, you build yeah. culture. And do you find, and touching on that, do you find in your experience that that culture, that supportive culture, because what you've described is is that symbiotic relationship between the sales team and the SE team. And for a company to be successful in its, its customer delivery or its, its service delivery, is that has to be on point. Um, mm -hmm. And as you mentioned about that culture being strong and in place, a lot of the feedback that I get from from people that I speak to as a recruiter is that you know they're looking to leave an organisation for a couple of reasons. One is that the tool those tools aren't in place to support them. Um, mm -hmm. Secondly, that the company's growing and they've just grown exponentially, but haven't put those systems in place. For you, from your point of view as a, as a trainer and someone with that wealth of experience that you have. Um, do you find that it's those issues tend to be with startups or tend to be with more established companies? Um, in, in your environment, SEs come and speak to you, where do you find the pain points are? Um, it depends. So the individual contributors need strong leadership, right? Mm -hmm. That's that, I think that's the first point. So somebody to rely on being able to push back, being able to say, dear AE, I love to work with you, but see, here's our process. And that's what we agreed as a sales engineering team, what we do with clients. Please let me have my discovery session, right? Otherwise, I can't support you here. Right? So you need this um, trust to your managers, right? And then you need managers who understand that you um, need those processes, maybe modern tools that, that are available right now, yeah, for measuring KPIs, for demo automation, right, all those things. They're incredibly helpful for healthy teams and, and scalable teams, yeah. And there's also what I see happening right now a lot is two trends. One goes into the direction of social media, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that means pre-sales, should have a kind of brand and companies support this. Yeah. Right. Their leaders support this. This is the first. And the, th the second is video outreach. Mm. So especially after the discovery session, right? If there was an open question from a stakeholder or something, you would send out a short video message that you record and, and where you answer this important point. Just short, right? But along this video content, like there's a person talking to you, creates uh, yeah a stronger bond yeah right and this is those are things 
a trend now in my perspective for what i see at least um in the sales engineering realm that's pretty interesting mm. right how do how the role extends right how, how they want to differentiate mm. um against the competition right yeah it's, that's interesting because you, you we've stepped into another domain of um, building that brand as a sales engineer, having that personal relationship, having that exposure. And mm -hmm. something that we discussed briefly during our conversation is something that others have spoken to me about within the SE environment. It's almost the ethics of sales engineering is do you have to do you have to believe in the product? Do you have to believe in the product to really get behind it, to really offer a great service? Um, or is it you're just going through the motions? What are your thoughts about that? Because you must have experienced that. You must have had, certainly had people come and speak to you about it. Oh, gosh, you have to believe. You have to fully believe. And not only in the product, but the market that it's creating, mm. the methodology that comes with the product, the new way of thinking you want to teach your clients when they use the product. Yeah. It's not just the product. It's always process people and technology or people yeah. first people yeah. process technology yeah. so technology is last also for pre-sales if you go in your first meeting with a client you don't speak technology first yeah you can simply say yes no simple answers to techn technological questions but you have to understand what what is your impact on the people in the company you're working with or you want to work with so <clears throat> i think this this is crucial and yes you have to be like you said before the evangelist right um clearly right but but about the change yeah. this this provocative thing you want to change in the market right this this needs to be in you you want to you want this change change yeah. is progress right mm -hmm. so you want to implement this change and i think then nothing can stop you right? yeah yeah and that's that's such an interesting point and Again, we go, we almost go back full circle, don't we? That if those systems aren't in place, as a sales engineer, you're passionate about your subject, you're passionate about the job that you're doing, you want to give a great service, you have to believe mm -hmm. in it. You you but it's resistant, isn't it? But people are resistant to change. And if those if those measures aren't in place for a holistic workforce, a holistic um, relationship amongst your sales team, amongst others in that organization. That's where you you can fall down. That's where you you know you can really struggle to actually put your point across. We've talked briefly about um, managing the sales cycle and and taking control of the deal. When you have that, when you have those obstacles where there's reluctance between whether that's a client or reluctance from those within the sales team. Have you got any tools that you put in place? I know we mentioned about uh, the big three. Have you got any other tools that you would suggest that you might fall back on or you? you've used in the past if, if you just to support that support your resilience and also to be able to push back yeah there there are some things but they depend on the context so what's often helped us also pushing back with clients right on requests on rfps for example right if you, you could always say yeah if you understand this the competitor does this right yeah um actually you, that's a great tip check if you get a word document check who so the the, the details of yeah. the word document who so the the final details who wrote this sometimes there's even the email address yeah. of the sales engineer from the competitor yeah. um good point. So, yeah, really good point. but you can push back clients saying look this is really a nice rfp but we don't work that traditionally if you want to understand how um, you could do this in a modern way please invite us right mm -hmm. or we're happy to to come and have a workshop yeah for example so th those are things depending on the context and your way you run sales um that's a way or pucs are another thing right most most pre-sales would go in there with a complete checklist of use cases and technical requirements but i would say forget this the only the only check mark is that the customer says oh i want to use this as my daily job right and that means getting in a team from the client implementing the PUC. And the PUC must be a real business case, right? Not just some artificial side case. <laughs> and um, when you do this, and you only agree to do this PUC when you have a, an appointment schedule where you can present the results of the PUC to executives, 
to the stale to stakeholders, to the people with the budget, right? Mm -hmm. So those are ways you can take control and paint patterns um, on client side, right? Interrupt their thinking, bring value by saying, no, not an artificial use case. Give, give us the thing that, that, that's the biggest in your company, where's the, the spotlight on this thing? I want to do this, I want to help you there. Mm. And really prove value, right? Yeah, yeah, just those kind of things yeah. you can you can always do. And you can say, like, dear AE, please, when you meet a prospect the first time and you think we will, will have a discovery call, give them a task to visit my profile. Because I linked my blog post there, I was on a podcast, I was on a conference, right? Let them see those articles. Mm -hmm. So they knew who's coming. Maybe there are provocative pieces yeah. on there with your new view, the tool of how you want to change the market. So that's incredibly um, control taking in that yeah. sense, right? Yeah. Because you let your assets work for you yeah, and build your credibility. Yeah, that's fantastic advice. It's a, a really good perspective as someone from your background has obviously gone into the training world, bringing on sales engineers to be able to, to, be able to share that. What would you be doing if you weren't in this? What would you be doing if you weren't, didn't have that background in, in sales engineering and now training? I, I don't understand the question. How yes, do you mean but, this? So if, if you weren't doing this job that you're doing now, if you weren't, yeah. didn't have that background as a sales engineer, what would you be doing? Would you be doing something completely different, another job, another completely different lifestyle? Oh. Yeah, no, I, I write fiction novels. So oh, that's really? what I love doing. Yeah, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, oh, fantastic. Yeah, that's that's the German side. <laughs> so yeah, yeah that, that's that's also part of my life. That's why I did did change into training. Yeah. Because um yeah, a full time job as an employee. Yeah. Um I I, I couldn't do this anymore. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I wanted to write and have an own business. So and that's what I did. Oh fantastic. Oh, what kind of fiction is it? Yeah, it's fantasy. It's, it's fantasy, oh, wow. and I start lit RPG. It's a term yeah. for you. So it's literature in an RPG world where yeah, yeah player like Ready Player One um, might be or or Jumanji, right? So those kind of things. Oh, that's fantastic. That's brilliant. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's fun. Oh, no, well, thank you so much for your time, Patrick. I, I know we're sort of running out slowly, um, but I'm really grateful for your time. Thank you so much. Yeah, likewise. Thank you that you. Um, yeah, took the time to talk to me and that you invited me, right? And yeah, oh, no, it's a pleasure. You know, it's been an absolute pleasure. You, you're, you're such a figure in the, in the sales engineering world. Um, it's been a real pleasure to sort of speaking with you sort of the, the last few times that we've spoken. So I'm really grateful that you've given up your time to come in and chat with me today. Thank you.